Hello, welcome to this session on historical research and archival research. In this session I will talk a bit about my own experience with historical research and hopefully you can learn something for your, for your research project and from the methodologies that I used. So first of all, why would you do uh, historical research? Um, a lot of people think, okay, historical research, that's just about old things um, that doesn't have that much relevance to now, but it actually does uh, when you look closely. And that's certainly what got me excited about historical research. And I'll give you a couple of examples of historical research which has significantly shaped um, the, the world as it is today. And um, the examples that I'll be talking about are examples from architectural history, because that's the, the field that I've been um, involved with. So the first example is uh, Robert Venturi, and um, he started uh, his career in the 1960s. Um, he's trained as an architect, but um, he uh, did historical research by uh, basically um, uh, first of all, he, you know, researching uh, buildings in, in Italy, and he was trying to find out how, they, how their composition uh, works, their, their you know, architectural composition. Um, and uh, so, so he documented lots of um, historical buildings in Italy, and it was looking at basically what about the compositions, the, the sort of the harmony and so on, what makes it interesting, what makes it beautiful. And um, that research, um, uh, then um, he compiled that research into a book um, published in the 1960s, uh, Complexity and Contradiction, Con Complexity and Contradiction uh, in Architecture. And that book has been hugely influential. It has been influential in the way we teach architecture now at, the, at UniSA. Um, it has been influential on the Garner building in some way. And, um, and the, the ideas are also directly um, went into uh, the, um, uh, one of his first buildings that he designed and built um, for his mother. Uh, this is a house for his mother, actually. Um, and as it's, it's still one of the um, you know, most significant um, uh, residential uh, buildings in, in the US. And um, basically, those ideas went into that, into all these buildings, and um, and have influenced our thinking since. Um, basically, because he went against the at the time um, prevalent um, uh, uh, theory that uh, architecture is about mainly about rationality and about uh, you know sort of post-war architecture was a lot about trying to make buildings as 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 rational uh, as possible. Make designing buildings like machines. That would um, would Le Corbusier uh, would say, and um, his his uh, ideas um, came out of historical research and went, but went against that. Um, and he basically used Italian uh, Renaissance and and Baroque buildings um, as um, as case studies uh, to to build, to, you know that. And his theories developed from these case studies. His idea on architecture. Um, so that's one example. Uh, there are lots of others. Um, another one I could pick is Aldo Rossi. Um, very important, um, his ideas on urban planning. You will find them in most uh, urban planning today. Um, and, uh, but when he published his ideas in the 1960s originally, um, the architecture of the city, um, that, you know, that wasn't so well accepted. He basically um, re-evaluated the historical um, classical city with their perimeter block um, type of master planning, planning, and um, and and basically said, actually, this is a really, really good way, uh, vibrant way of making cities um, that you know creates uh, good urban spaces and uh, creates active streets and so on, and um, and and so those ideas, uh, they are we are still um, you know we're still using them in urban planning. Look at um, Bowden um, in you know near Adelaide. Um, just outside the CBD, you know that um, that has been influenced by those kind of ideas. Uh, there is another uh, example of how uh, historical research um, shaped our um, our future and our present decisively. Um, this is a uh, uh, Herman Mathesius. Uh, he also trained as an architect, uh, lived in London for a couple of years uh, for for his work, and um, he was interested in uh, studying. Um, residential buildings in 
Britain and in England. And he basically uh, thought that there was something unique about them. They weren't planned like a lot of classical buildings, say, in, in France and in, in, in Germany, Italy, and so on. Um, there was something unique about them. They were uh, organized in a more, in some way, they were more functional, but in a way that they, um, their facade often uh, related more closely to what was happening in the interior. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't as formal the facades, and he thought well, there's a lot we can learn from those houses. Um, his ideas. Um, he published a book called The English House, and um, and those ideas uh, they basically um, they um, they led him to or he they 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 were they influenced his his work he returned to germany and he he founded the um, deutsche werkbund um, a very well known um, organization at the time that promoted good design in uh, crafts in architecture and so on and in, in also in industrial production and those ideas that he got from the english houses um, shaped also the ideas of the deutsche werkbund um, which in turn was uh, the key reference point for um, the uh, Bauhaus, and um, and basically um, the you know the ideas uh, that uh, developed since then um, from uh, about how we approach modern modernist design. So, um, but uh, so it's it's worth bearing in mind that um, that you know his ideas on on what is good design were shaped by him studying um, historical precedents. Um, even if it was recent history at the time, those were 19th century houses, that was recent history, but um, they shaped his ideas on uh, what, you know, what is um, good, uh, good architecture in, in the future. Uh, there's another example of a successful uh, historical research project outside of architecture. Um, she is a lecturer at UniSA, um, uh, Kira Lindsay. And uh, she just published a book, which is um, which, became, which has become an Australian bestseller, um, called *The Convict's Daughter*. It's all based on uh, historical research of actually uh, um, one of her uh, ancestors, and and the kind of scandal around her life. And she made that into a um, into a you know now into a publication that has now become very very popular, and probably influenced people's thinking of what Australia would have been like in the, in the 19th century. Um, how did I come to actually do um, historical research and <clears throat> for my uh, PhD project? Um, it started with, um, I, I was working on a lot of uh, residential projects in, in Britain um, for various architects. And, um, and I went to one uh, seminar um, presentation with different speakers where they were talking about um, my London vernacular, <clears throat> how historical buildings in London have influenced their thinking on, um, on good housing design. One of the presenters was Alison Brooks. She is uh, one, she, you know, she's a well-known architect um, in, in Britain and um, also uh, world, world, worldwide. And um, she's involved in a lot of residential buildings. And she was talking about how this kind of architecture from the 19th century um, has influenced her um, thinking on what is good um, housing design. And the claim that she made at the time and a lot, of, um, a lot of the other presenters was that, you know, those are great buildings, great residential buildings, and they were designed without architects. And I thought, what, what do you mean they were designed without architects? Um, I just couldn't believe what she, what she was saying. And, um, and, and I w went up to her afterwards after the lecture and I said, um, is there any way I can find out more about this? Um, and you know, first she looked at me a bit skeptically. Why? Am, what am I asking her? And um, she said to me, "Well, um, you know, you can speak to the Survey of London. They've probably looked into that." Um, and uh, as it as it happened, I um, they became my co-supervisors. Um, they're now based at the um, at Bartlett at UCL, um, and I did my um, PhD at the Institute of Historical Research um, in London. Um, and um, so basically, um, yeah, so I, I did speak to them <laughs> and, um, and it did influence um, uh, my, my, my PhD. And basically I was looking at that idea um, uh, or that, that, that claim, that assumption um, that um, 
that residential, those residential houses which you can see here, you know, were they designed um, without architects? Uh, and if, if they were, how did it happen? <laughs> so I was really, really curious about that. What did I have to do first? I first had to do a literature review. That's, you know, what, we, what you start with in, in your course um, on research methods. Um, that's why we teach you that skill. So um, first, you've got to do a literature review. You have to find out, hey, um, you know, what, have, what have people written about this so far? Um, what have people said about this so far? Maybe somebody has already written my, my uh, uh, research project, has already done it. Um, so I looked at people who have uh, talked about um, uh, architecture without architects, and I also looked at um, uh, uh, basically publications specifically on residential buildings in London of the late 19th and early 20th century. And um, also um, worth uh, bearing in mind, uh, this, is, this is a survey from, um, uh, from actually among architects that um, voted over half of the people voted that period of Victorian and, and, and Warden housing as the most um, significant period of, the, um, of uh, residential housing in, in, in London. So that was, the, that was the period that I was focusing on. And it has influenced a lot of the way kind of uh, the, the, uh, the way um, housing is designed now uh, in terms of typologies, but also in terms of you know, shapes of windows and things like that. And so one idea that was um, going around was that, is that a lot of the housing in the 19th century was uh, designed with uh, pattern books. So that basically um, people wouldn't need architects because they could simply pick up uh, a, you know, a book of typical floor plans, elevations and so on um, done by you know, somebody else. And they, so they could pick that up and simply build that. Um, so they don't need architects. And there are some people that also are proposing that um, as a way forward for good housing uh, today, uh, which are those examples. So here is an example from a pattern book. And uh, so there you can see that that is a pattern book. Um, that's an elevation from a pattern book. And that is an actual build example, which, and you can find examples that closely relate to those pattern books. But um, I haven't yet found any build example that exactly looks like a drawing, like the drawing in the pattern book. Um, so um, then the question becomes is, um, you know, which one influenced um, which uh, first? So was it first the pattern book or was it first the building? So basically that claim didn't quite hold up. It was certainly an influence, um, but um, there is essentially no proof that um, uh, and no evidence that uh, any of the houses in London were um, identical copies from pattern books. So, um, so then, who were those guys? Who were who was that guy with that um, with that hat uh, on it, uh, and and who has a different hat from the rest of the uh, people on the on the building side? Um, so, somehow he has a role which involves him spending more time in the office than um, than on the building side, um, actually, um, which you can see from his uh, from his clothes. Um, so who was that guy? Was it an architect? Was he, um, uh, you know, was he a builder uh, or um, so on? Um, I then had to look at, you know, what is the methodology? How can I actually find evidence for um, investigating this question of, um, you know, who were the designers and architects of that type of housing? Um, so one question, and there are different approaches you can take in historical research, but an interesting question is, um, how do we know what really happened? You know, how do we know that what really happened is not um, is not what we see through the lens of of what sort of our reality is like today? Um, so, yeah. So there are many uh, ways you can read history, and and we've in one of the other lectures um, we talk about the um, you know the kind of different um, uh, theoretical frameworks. But certainly a, a, a core question or interesting question is, you know, what did, what did really happen? What is, um, yeah, what, what really happened in the, in the past? And, and how can you find out about that? Um, now, uh, I mentioned already the Survey of London um, based at the Barclay UCL. So they were part of my uh, supervisors um, and also at the historical, Institute of Historical Research. They all had a really, really strong tradition in um, uh, using primary sources uh, for uh, historical research. They have a lot of uh, famous historians 
um, uh, working, and also urban historians, architectural historians, uh, working with them and, and working at their, um, at their departments. So it was great to draw on that kind of experience. And so one of the things that they were um, uh, telling me was, you know, you need to find uh, primary sources. You need to find sources that actually that tell you, you know, what, what really happened during the time. And so I went, went out, um, you know, looking for those sources. And sometimes they were tricky to find, sometimes they were easier to find. But I basically had to go to local archives. Um, those are some examples of the kind of sources that I found. So I found some from building applications. Those are actually the, um, so the records from the building applications, um, the kind of letters that went with it, um, the kind of drawings that went with it where the building applications were still there. And some of, a lot of these sources have been burnt, essentially, have been lost in London. Um, here in Australia, you're, and in Adelaide, you're actually more fortunate that, um, that there is uh, still a lot of that has, has been maintained and it's great to have the Architecture Museum as a source here. So um, these are other examples of sources. So there are some um, uh, auction plans. So that sort of tells you how estates were uh, planned at the time. Brochures, sales brochures. Sales brochures can tell you a lot. They can tell you a lot about um, what actually, you know, what are they highlighting as the merits of this, um, of this building? What are they promoting? Um, it tells you a lot about what people were interested in at the time as well. So what were the values of, of, um, at the time? I did have to break down my um, research into manageable chunks. And that's also very, very important uh, for your project. You have to um, you know, bear in mind what you can actually accomplish for the time that you have. So you might have to you know, maybe you can only look at one house or one building, um, but you can research that and, and, and relate it to other types of research. Um, but you basically have to try to find, you have to limit your, your research around, and I did that around sources, around particular case studies. What did I find? Um, I did some uh, quantitative research um, where I actually took um, a sample of about 200 building applications um, that I found and I looked at who were the people who submitted those building applications. And I could find that actually there was a significant portion of the people who submitted them were architects. So the claim that there were no architects involved um, didn't hold up. But um, you could also see that um, quite a few of those were actually architect and surveyors or um, came from other backgrounds, were builders or, um, or just surveyors or uh, engineers or, and so on. Um, so it tells you also a lot about the way the profession worked at the time. It just wasn't as specialized. So there were a lot of overlapping um, occupations. Um, and then I looked at how that uh, changed. And you could certainly see that the proportion of um, people that just used the title architect, it increased over time. Um, and and um, it also had to do with development size. It then had to do with um, also, you could see where, where was the, the industry actually located. So mapping things it can also be a very, very interesting way of reading history. So you can tell that most people, that was very local um, uh, occupation. Most, most of the businesses involved in housing design were locally based at the time. Um, I also mapped um, different builders that were involved in actually you know, building up an area. Um, how much did they build? Um, I had a look at, um, basically I found out that it was not only architects who designed houses, but various occupations were involved. And you could see that, for example, from the letterheads that I used. I'm running through this quite quickly. I just want to give you some examples of actual sources and the kind of things that they can tell you, which makes it original research, because nobody has yet, um, you know, if nobody has actually looked at them from that angle that you're looking at them. So um, there you can have post office records, which tells you something about the kind of how occupations were overlapping at the time. So I did find actually who they were. I found out very um, from many different angles, um, many different perspectives. I looked at that same question um, and found out who were the architects who actually designed housing in London. Um, <clears throat> I also found that they didn't come from pattern books, but very often um, or were usually custom designed for each site, um, which is a significant change in the way we often see housing at the time as, as sort of very repetitive. But actually, it, it wasn't. It was just repeating 
um, a common kind of language, but it wasn't. Um, it was fairly custom um, designed, but it was c influenced, and it certainly uh, connected. There were relationships to plans that you could find in pattern books. They just weren't identical. Um, uh, so these are some examples of application drawings, and you can see that there was a very varied um, type of uh, level of skill as well involved. So some other samples, you can see that some of them are very, very skilled drawings. Um, and, um, and sometimes it was builders who simply, they had the training and they could, you know, they could draw well. And, um, and they, so they were master builders in the sense they were designing them as well. It was influenced by uh, uh, journals at the time, the kind of things they would see in, in, in journals and magazines, just like the way we do it today. It was influenced by the, the way the production happened of these different elements and how they could be made. I looked at that as well. And um, so that um, even the urban planning could be much more sophisticated than is often assumed. Um, there's something interesting you can look at also in the way the, the, um, the design was influenced by um, the building codes um, at the time and the, the, the urban design codes at the time, which actually I think are quite interesting because they're quite quite simple, but actually very, very effective. And it also had to do with the way the system worked um, financially. Um, and I, I've, I've um, done some research on that. Um, I am running through this quite quickly. Um, I also found that there were very varied um, people involved in housing design at the time, which actually contributed to, a, um, to the, the, the quite a vibrant and varied exp um, appearance of the uh, of the buildings. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I can say about that. It also reflected the society at the time. So this was these were houses for um, lower income people. These were houses for higher income people. Um, at 19th century, the, it was very, very hierarchical. Um, the, um, the way the even also housing design worked and which is then reflected in this is the booth map, which tells you about something about the social conditions of that same area um, that was built up. Um, you can look at the census, which tells you something about the people who lived in there, um, what type of, you know, what was it actually made for, and so you can cross-reference these different types of sources. Um, those are some drawings. Um, so some of those drawings were very, very basic, um, and these were, these were submitted by a builder who had very ba fairly basic drawing skills, but they were good enough to, um, to design a house like that. There was a, um, the state owner had a very important role in, and a state agent had a very important role actually in the urban design by approving and, and, and so on um, and coordinating the process. Um, so I went through this quite quickly um, just briefly to say that there were uh, come out some outcomes, uh, also there are a lot of outcomes that are, that are coming out of this and I'm working on a, um, a book publication at the moment um, which actually came out of a um, out of a conference that we had mobilizing London's housing histories and it's basically relating historical uh, case studies and issues to the current housing crisis in London and what we can learn from it. Um, there is, you know, there is that kind of influence on the London vernacular which has become a style um, almost and which is trying to reference and, and, and link to the historical um, design of buildings. The pattern book, I mentioned that already, urban design strategies such as custom design, so there is a link um, a link to that that I've been uh, working on and, and, and writing about. Uh, this was for a competition um, uh, uh, entry um, for London housing ideas that I submitted and was um, yeah that was one of the winning entries. And um, and then also I think in terms of urban design there are a lot of things that uh, you can you can learn from that. Um, we talk about the compact living and so on and and there's some excellent precedents actually from that time and how they were developed. You can also learn something from those houses in terms of uh, adaptability and longevity. Um, so I hope this was an interesting introduction and I hope and I think there are lots of other things that you can draw on um, when you look at the historical sources. I would encourage you to have a look at the videos that are uploaded also of um, about the architecture museum and the introduction to that. And I'll just leave you um, here with that quote. Um, on um, about historical research 
if society looks to historians for answers in the sense of firm predictions and unequivocal generalizations, it will be disappointed. What will emerge from the pursuit of relevance is something less tangible, but in the long run more valuable, a surer sense of the possibilities latent in our present condition. <laughs> for as long as historians hold that end in view, their subject will retain its vitality and its claim on the support of the society in which they work. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you I hope this will be, was interesting. Thank you. Bye.